Webster University story has compelled for more than a century. A small Catholic college for women that has grown into an independent, co-educational, global university. Our founder's mission of meeting an unmet need continues as we welcome an increasingly diverse student population here in Webster Groves and at locations around the world. Many Webster students were, and still are, the first in their families to graduate from college. Many were, and still are, women. It is the stories of four such alumni that we will hear. How these women came to Webster, the transformative power of their Webster education and their tremendous impact. They make us proud and they fuel our commitment to continue to be a community that supports women's learning and leading. I am honored to share these conversations with you. Whether these women were playing intercollegiate baseball, publishing best-selling short stories and novels, photographing some of the most famous performers in the world, pioneering network television production, or leading medical commands for the U.S. Army, their stories need to be told. And their stories are not finished. First, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Webster graduate Susan Parapo, recognized in the Baseball Hall of Fame. That is right, a woman who gained notice in Cooperstown. She is also a published author who started learning her craft here at Webster's Pearson House. Of Susan's collection of short stories, the LA Times said, Susan is a true natural who delivers tough miracles with seemingly effortless grace. Susan's experience at Webster gave her the opportunity to live out a childhood dream and discover some new dreams along the way. I'm Susan Parabo. I graduated from Webster in 1989 with a degree in English with an emphasis in creative writing. Accidentally, I ended up being the first woman to play NCAA baseball. So I loved baseball most um, of all the sports uh, from a very early age. By the time I was six or seven years old, I loved baseball more than I loved anything else. I dreamed of playing for the St. Louis Cardinals when I was a kid, and I dreamed of being the first woman Major League Baseball player, you know. I kind of put that dream behind me because now I was 17 years old. I had an unusual educational path. I dropped out of high school and got my GED. I told my folks uh, that I was interested in Webster and my mother called the admissions office and the woman in the admissions office said, people come to Webster by many different paths and we make it work. And so I thought of Webster as a place for the arts, film and music, but it had not occurred to me that I would play sports at Webster. One day I was going to the cafeteria for dinner and I saw a sign that said baseball meeting and I was like, oh, a baseball team. So I went to the tryouts, I made the team. So they welcomed me onto the team and I went to every practice. I was often the first person there and the last person to leave. I was just so happy to be able to play baseball. Honestly, I had spent my whole life wanting to play organized baseball and I got my first opportunity in college, which is crazy. And I got to do it with a bunch of really great, funny, supportive, wonderful guys. And it was a dream come true. And so it was never for me something that was about making a statement or saying something about women's rights or about women's place in baseball or sports in general. It was totally selfish. I mean, in the best way. Like, all I wanted to do was play baseball. The Hall of Fame made note of that. That was all just gravy. What is it about Webster that's attractive to women of all different varieties of goals and dreams and professions? Well, I discovered while I was here that I was a writer. 
and it was not something that I knew when I arrived. I came in as a film major and I then did some screenwriting and thought, oh, I think this is the part of film I really like. And I took a fiction class and then it was just like, oh, this is it. This, this, is, this, this is, is me. This is the spot. Mm -hmm. Then I had my second creative writing class with David Cluel. And David was the one who really um, said, this is something that you can do. This is something that you can be. I knew by the time I graduated that I wanted to get an MFA in creative writing. When I went to graduate school, what I discovered was that I wasn't just gonna teach to support my writing, that I really also had a passion for teaching. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And so it wasn't a question anymore of, well, I have to do this to do this. It was, I get to do both. How do you think about what is success for you across the writing you've already done and where you're headed? The most exciting and rewarding um, moments and experiences I have associated with writing is writing is the actual writing itself. I'm happy to have published books, of course, so I don't take that for granted at all. But the work itself, to me, has always been the best reward. That loving the thing itself, loving the experience, whether it's taking grounders or writing stories, that's what it's about. That this was a place where I could come um, and feel comfortable and be myself and be whatever I wanted to be. I could be a baseball player. I could be a writer. I'm a Gorlock forever, I can't help it. And I got to realize a dream that I had had since I was a child and which could not have been realized pretty much in any other way at any other place. Sheila Baxter served in the U.S. Army for 30 years, rising to the rank of Brigadier General, the first woman and second African-American to hold that rank in the Medical Service Corps. General Baxter was once named by Newsweek magazine as one of the most powerful women in America. Her leadership skills have been an asset to Webster, having served on our Board of Trustees. Despite her accolades and honors, she is still working to educate herself and help others and doing so with grace and humility. I am Brigadier General Sheila Baxter. I graduated from Webster University in 1984 with a master's degree in health services management. I studied at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Uh, Webster University at that time had a satellite program. I grew up in Franklin, Virginia. Uh, my parents, John and Mary, who are deceased now, uh, they taught us uh, the value of faith, education, and public service. Like my mother was a nurse. My father served in uh, the Korean War. And so sports was really my passion early on. I mean, that's all I wanted to do. The cousins and my brothers would play basketball in the backyard. I picked up the game, learned it, played in uh, elementary, a little bit in elementary, middle school, high school, and on to college. I did get a small scholarship for basketball in, at Virginia State University. And I learned so many skills from being an athlete, from discipline to goal setting. Being in college as a junior, my roommate was my cousin, and she was married to an Army officer, and he was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Her husband was a captain. He showed us around. I saw soldiers walking, you know, in uniform, in cadence, and I saw the, the military as a team sport. I was taken by that. The light bulb came on and said, you know what, I said to myself, I can do this. So I went back that same year and joined ROTC. How did you come to Webster? They offered 
a master's degree in health services management, which, which was, was exactly your area of my area of responsibility and concentration. So it was perfect. It was on post. Of course, it was 1982, and I went to school at night, and it was a seminal moment for me. What doors opened for you after your Webster degree, uh, and how did your career develop through yeah. uh, being a, a brigadier general? It was the foundation that taught me how important it is for the administration of a hospital to the medical mission. I was able to be promoted below the zone in the military, which is a year ahead of your peers mm, because mm. of getting the master's degree at Webster. That and gave you that advantage. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And because for me, it helped me to understand that Webster was forward thinking in the 80s by putting those programs on post and installations to help, uh, you know, soldiers. I was in a Desert Storm in Iraq. Area of concentration was uh, medical logistics. It's equipping the hospitals with the necessary supplies and equipment that they needed to accomplish the mission. It was dangerous, right, because we're at war, but uh, we were focused, uh, we worked together as a team, and we accomplished the mission. 2002. I was stationed at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and I received a call from the Surgeon General for my promotion to Brigadier General. Congratulations. I was completely silent. <laughs> I couldn't talk. I, I was overwhelmed. Those are accomplishments, and I'm proud of them. I had a pastor who always said to me, the higher you go, the more humbler you should become and that stuck with me. What I'm most proud of is the 30 years of serving soldiers. And it was 30 years of amazing journey, traveling all over the world, leading soldiers, and a little girl from Franklin, Virginia. My story is any other little girl's story across this country. You can do what you wanna do Mary Alice Dwyer Dobbin, or Mickey, as we know her, studied here in the 1960s when it was Webster College. One of Mickey's favorite memories from her time at Webster is the day she and her fellow students learned that Conrad Hilton would fund the construction of the Performing Arts Center we know as the Webster University Loretto Hilton Center. A visionary among Webster alumni, Mickey honors the legacy of our founders through her service, particularly as a former trustee, her generous scholarship support, and the lifelong connections she maintains and creates with fellow alumni. I graduated from Webster College in 1963 with a Bachelor of Arts degree, uh, and my major was speech and drama. It was, it was all women and most of our professors were indeed nuns. That was, that was what drew me to Webster in the first place, uh, the Sisters of Loretto and the Speech and Drama Department. The Sisters did indeed create a community. They were intelligent, independent, forward-thinking women. Mm -hmm. And those were the qualities that they instilled in us, yeah. exactly. So can you think of examples where that instinct that they had in their educational commitment to create independent thinking women. One of my favorite examples uh, is uh, an address that, that Sister Jacqueline, Jacqueline Grennan Wexler, gave to the student body. In this particular address, she said to us that the future of Webster was really up to us. That once we got out of Webster, we needed to stay connected and we needed to uh, continue to support Webster in, in any way that we could. The nuns, the women, told us girls that we could do anything we wanted to do. We could be anybody we wanted to be. And somewhere, you know, that was in the, the back of my head. One of the, the classes that I had taken at Webster was just a one semester class uh, in television production. Mm. I, I learned early on that my, uh, my talent did not lie on the stage, but rather behind the scenes. And so I said to myself, you know, 
Theaters can be dark, but television has so many hours a day filling the hours with, mm -hmm. with shows, and so there must be more career opportunities in television. And I, I went to New York on a, a sort of a job hunting vacation expedition. It, indeed, I, I, started, I started with some very low level jobs, had a title of assistant to the producer, but it was really gopher, glorified gopher. My first job was at ABC, first in daytime programming and then in children's programming. And it was at a time when the network was trying to promote women into middle management positions. And so I hit it at, right, at just the right time, you know, then started moving onward and, and upward and beyond. It was ambition, you know, and, and, and wanting more and wanting new opportunities. And also believing in myself, which is something that I think I, I got here at Webster. I certainly enjoyed my career in television production behind the scenes, primarily in soap operas. The soap opera world was indeed a soap opera. And keeping all those balls balanced uh, from morning to night and beyond was challenging. And I, I think I managed to do that and to do it with grace and intelligence and fairness. Look, people were nice enough to open the door for me when I was knocking on doors. One of the things uh, that I have always tried to do is support Webster students. When my class of 63 celebrated our 50th anniversary, we, we had all been so close to the Sisters of Loretto that I spearheaded a movement to underwrite a scholarship for a fine arts student mm -hmm. in honor of the Sisters of Loretto. What is it about Webster that uniquely uh, sort of equips women uh, to be strong career women, strong people of service, strong people of character, um, with a global view. Well, I, I think the secret sauce is, in, is the people who teach. I think that my era w was moved by these strong, independent, free spirits who were the Sisters of Loretto. And I think that we were encouraged to be the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the, the mission was to serve the underserved, to serve the women who could not necessarily get a higher education. And subsequently, with the expansion of Webster to worldwide campuses, it's still fulfilling that same mission. If you visit our main campus in Webster Groves, you will see the statue of our beloved mascot, the Gorlock. This is part of the legacy of alumna, Gabby Dimicky. Gabby helped spearhead the fundraising campaign that created this statue. She made a permanent mark on our campus as a student leader, and now she is establishing her reputation in the photography industry, capturing images of some of the most famous musicians in the world. I graduated from Webster University in 2016 with a BA in photography. So I grew up on a small farm, kind of like 30 minutes away from any big stores, kind of really out in the middle of nowhere. For my parents, they were like, it's gonna make more sense for us to just homeschool you. And then that way also, we can take you to do other art projects and you know field trips to the museum and things like that and really cultivate that. I got my first camera when I was like 11 or 12. Yeah, ever since then, I, I was just always drawn to however much I could shoot, I would take my camera everywhere with me. I loved how when I was taking photos of other people, I could really capture their personality and characteristics in the image. And then when it became time to go to college, um, you know, I sat down with my parents and they're like, you know, do you want to do photography? Is that something you want to study? Is that something you want to do as a career? And I decided, yeah, that's what I want to go for. So luckily I had the most supportive parents ever. My parents wanted something that was in Missouri that was just a couple hours away. So if, if I would need them for something, they felt like they were close enough that they could be there for me. Cause that was something growing up on a farm, I'd always wanted to move to a city. And so St. Louis was like the biggest city that I'd ever lived in. 
Definitely Webster opened my eyes to all of the opportunities I could do in communications and in photography. I felt like I got lucky with so many professors who were willing to go out of their way to really mentor us. You know, it's not every student that studies abroad or does it during sophomore year. Yes. And so talk a little bit about that. Never been to Europe before. You know, I'd never traveled eight hours on a plane before that. So it was very formative for me. And then how your world just opened up. And that just, it really opened my whole eyes to all the opportunities in the world, all the different places I wanted to travel, all the people and cultures I wanted to learn about. I think that part of the message to anybody who will hear this and, and see your story is that you don't have to be advanced in age or career to be making a difference. For sure. I, I was the first in my um, family to finish college, first gen college student. I didn't know anybody in the photography, art, music industry. So the fact that I could, you know, take everything I learned from Webster and then go on to have a career in that industry, like it's definitely a testament to everything that I learned on, on the journey. My life now is a little bit crazy. I'm kind of jet setting all the time, flying to like different countries, working with celebrities and musicians and photographing them behind the scenes, photographing their concerts, music festivals, um, music videos, just kind of all the things in the music industry. Well, uh, I just got to go to the World Cup in Qatar, which was crazy. I did a tour in South America, uh, Saudi Arabia, we did a couple festivals in the Netherlands, uh, Italy, Romania, yeah, all over. Concert photography is actually really difficult. Um, the lighting is changing all the time. Colors are changing, the actual positioning of the lights is changing. So you, you really have to be creative in how you can make the lighting work and also still showcase, you know, the personality and character of whoever you're shooting. Yeah, there's definitely still um, a big divide in the music industry in terms of like gender disparity. But that's why I want to keep doing it, to keep raising awareness and keep getting more women involved in the music industry. My advice to aspiring photographers would definitely be to put yourself out there. Really putting your work out there and not being afraid or nervous to, to put your photos out into the world. Uh, my biggest goal was to see it published in Vogue and I got published in Vogue last year. So I took photos of Paris Fashion Week and it was published in an article. It was definitely, I felt like it was a culmination of like my whole life working up to this. And then to see it, it's like, okay, wow. Like I literally made this happen by working hard and by, you know, continuing to do my craft. And this is where it got me. Like it, it was a really cool moment. If it can happen for me, a girl who grew up, you know, on a farm in Missouri, it can definitely happen for anybody. <laughs> As these women recounted their Webster stories, I hope you were called elements of your own story how this community has created pathways for women to learn, to lead, and to provide opportunities for others by meeting unmet needs. Each of us has a Webster story, and that is true for me as well. Like many, I am the first in my immediate family to graduate from college. Strong women in my family and community created opportunities and provided role models for me. My mother, who completed one year of junior college in the 1940s and later returned to employment as a bank teller, subsequently retired from the First National Bank of Lockport, Illinois as the president of the bank. As I began my career as a high school teacher in Vandalia, Illinois, I lived next door to a remarkable woman who was a retired English teacher, published author, and leader of many local arts and history initiatives. Mary Birchie, class of 1933, Webster College. I wrote her biography and never forgot her singular story even as my ambitions took me to earn a PhD, pursue a career in higher education, and ultimately seek a presidency of my own. Many years later, Webster's story compelled me to interview here. And from there, my Webster story grew beginning with the February day that my appointment was announced and I received a congratulatory call from Jacqueline Brennan Wexler. I felt called to this community by the power of Webster women, and now it is my honor 
to share the untold stories of so many Webster women in full confidence that the opportunity created by the Sisters of Loreto in 1915 continues to soar. It is up to all of us to assure that Webster women like Susan, Sheila, Mickey and Gabby, and so many others continue to learn and lead. I invite you to join me as we together support the women of Webster. Thank you.